Okay, nice and easy. Nice and what the fuck? Oh my god, bro, this game sucks so hard. Hello, and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Hardcore Mode, Episode Seven. Another lesson in space travel, rocket science, and pain. In KSP Hardcore Mode, there are no retries. If I mess up three hours into a mission, it ends right there. Kerbals are subject to permadeath. Jebediah died in episode one, and he's been gone since. Science points are hard to come by, and the worst thing of all is I have to give Kerbals life support during space missions or else they will rebel and refuse to work. And all these rules are set into place to hold us back from the two ultimate goals of KSP Hardcore, completing the tech tree and exploring every single body in the Kerbal system. Last time we built a brand new space station, stranded no less than four Kerbals on faraway planets, lost my mind a little bit, and wrapped it all up by changing out the crew aboard the Kerge station. This time we are going to attempt to land a crew on Duna. Uh, what's going on right now? What's going on right now? Explore two gas giants and all of their moons, including a space egg, and then attempt to harvest a moon for its resources. This episode begins by reviving the Pillager missions. The old Pillagers were intended as an unmanned craft to raid nearby planets for their science, and this one is no different. Although it does have more Delta V because we need to go further away than ever before. You see, because so far in our space program, with the exception of two missions to Jewel, we have stayed relatively close to home. But all that is about to change. The Pillager missions were designed to be the first craft to visit and document the three outer gas giants. Sarnus, Uriam, and Nida. But these aren't just any normal missions because they will take decades to reach their intended targets. The Pillager 6 is the first to leave the launch pad. It's a standard nuclear rocket setup, except equipped with larger and more powerful solar panels to hopefully allow us to get power all the way out into the boonies of the solar system, as well as some extra smaller satellites just in case we want to try and land on one of those moons too. But enough yapping, it's time for action. prepared and launched three separate probes to scout out the farthest reaches of our solar system and the first to reach its target has arrived. After six years of transit time, the scientists at the Void Space Center are ecstatic for a chance to explore the Sarna system. The most interesting body here is the planet itself with a huge ring system. There was much debate about whether or not these rings would cause a spaceship to instantly explode upon contact, but thankfully it didn't happen. We then used the gravity well of Sarnus to burn retrograde and make contact with the furthest out moon and the first stop on our tour, the moon Tecto. Tecto is a strange place. It seems to have some sort of flowing liquid on its surface. Our scientists theorize it could be some sort of liquid methane, but one of our probes is dispatched to check it out further. We start descending and notice that it even has an atmosphere. We get lower and lower and I suddenly lose control of the craft and it falls into a death spin and into the surface at 35 meters per second. What the hell is this? Okay, that sucked. All right then. Sadly, the Space Kraken was not interested in letting us know the secrets of Tecto, so we move on to the second body in the Sarna system, Slate. And also, it was at this point in my Kerbal Space Program career that I discovered action groups. So if you don't currently use them, then allow me to make your life so much easier. Instead of just right-clicking every single part of your ship and manually collecting science like a peasant, you can tap this little hammer and wrench icon right over here in the hotbar. This allows you to press one button and do all sorts of things at the exact same time. This is incredibly useful and I recommend placing all the science into one action group so you can science at maximal efficiency. To be quite honest with you guys, the moon of Slate kind of grosses me out. And I don't really want to talk about it. I mean, just look at it. It literally looks like skin. Ugh. Brother, ugh. 
What's that? Moving on to the third stop in our tour is the moon known as Elu. If you play stock KSP, this moon might stand out to you because it's normally its own planet. But for some reason or another, the Outer Planets mod puts it into orbit around Sarnas. I do actually like Elu though. Its surface has enormous cracks, running all the way up and down. It's pretty metal. And it gives us signs just like the others. We get a pretty cool shot of staging the rocket. And now we get to move on to the best moon of Sarnas. The one I like to call the Space A. It's actually named Avok, but let's be real, it's a Space A. And after having gathered all of the science around every other body, I want to try to land on it. But there are many problems with egg landing. The gravity around this thing is almost not even there at all. It's like trying to land on Gilly, but even worse. To achieve this shape means that basically every square inch of the egg is on a steep curve. So there really aren't any flat spots to land. And finally, my probe has no landing gear either. Needless to say, I didn't have high hopes coming in for the landing. I burned retrograde until I can get into an orbit around the egg, burned off all of my horizontal velocity, and came in for a nice and easy touchdown. What the f***? <laughs> oh, my oh my god, bro, this game sucks so hard. You just hit the fast travel button, just tap the old fast travel button, and then your entire rocket explodes for for basically no reason. And then my probe exploded for actually no reason. This is one of the many reasons why you should play KSP with quick saves and quick loads enabled. But I chose this life, so now I get to deal with the consequences. Anyways, on to the next mission. Our engineers have been wanting to test the limits of Kerbal Engineering and have designed a risky, downright dastardly idea. They want to create an outpost on Duna. It's one of the closest planets to us and is practically begging to be explored. We have sent out a probe here before, but its communications weren't really strong enough, so it kind of just drifted aimlessly around Duna's moon, Ike. So here's the idea. The dust outpost is going to be sitting on Duna for a very long time, probably forever, so we need a way of increasing our test subject's time that they can spend in space. And I think I know just how to do it. This is the Duna colonization module. Until now, all of our bases have had a set amount of habitation time that will run out, turning our Kerbals into rebels and ruining our space planes. But with the help of this part right here, we can actually take our rebelling Kerbals and give them some rest and relaxation time, turning them back to our loyal minions once again and allowing the mission to continue. But for this to work, we need something called Colony Supplies. Now, it would be completely understandable for you to think that Colony Supplies and Supplies are the same thing, but you would be wrong. Colony Supplies are created through some incomprehensible production chain, and you would need a degree in Kerbal Space Program to create them. I, on the other hand, am kind of dumb. So how are we going to get colony supplies? Well, I had an idea. Just stuff them into a bag and duct tape it to the side of our base. Ingenuity. The rest of our base was constructed using familiar k, &K base parts, and Zach and Mr. Kern were selected, two veteran scientists who, having recovered from being stranded in space for several years, were ready to undertake the most ambitious mission yet. They were not going to be the first Kerbals to land on another planet, but also the first to try and land on a body with an atmosphere. Their craft was launched almost overheated, and endured a year-long mission out to Duna. Upon entering orbit around Duna's moon, Ike, we say hi to the lost satellite from episode 3, collect some science, Zack hops out to reset our experiments, and we scout out a spot to land. Upon selecting a spot to land, we begin to endure re-entry. We lose some antenna, but all things considered, it could be a lot worse. A lot of preparation has led up to this moment, and two veteran astronauts' lives were on the line here. I was indeed feeling the pressure as well. Uh, what's going on right now? What's going on right now? Is it safe to deploy these? Safe? It's safe? Okay. Deploying other shoots. Don't explode. I beg of you. Okay. All the parachutes are deployed. My nav ball is completely broken. But we do not fear. We don't crack under pressure. Oh my god, this is so scary. That, I feel like it's under control now. But there for a moment, that was rough. Also, thank you to the person that told me that I could switch between these two levels. That's incredibly helpful. Coming down, coming down. Okay. What the hell is this? What the hell is- No, what is this? What is this for real though? A perfect landing. But I think somehow the parachutes caused the craft to continue falling and it flipped over and then the strangest thing happened. Apparently this landing was so flawless that the space crack in itself intervened to right my base a truly magical experience. Zack and Mr. Kerman spent several years on the surface of Duna, 
collecting all of the data from our experiments and sending them back home just like Noodle did before them. And after several years of doing this, it's time to check in on the science situation. 6,616 science. Feels good, man. We were able to knock out most of the remaining tech nodes, and we are left with six before we can complete the tech tree. But just as we finish researching those nodes, we get a word from Pillager 7. It's finished its 11-year trip and is now entering the Uriam system, so let's check on how that's doing. Upon entering the system, we are immediately struck by the moons this planet has. Two of them are basically in the same orbit, just at different positions. And this moon has a moon also? That's kind of weird, but undeterred, Pillager 7 gets into orbit around Wall. Now I'm pretty sure that Wall is just a walnut scaled up to the size of a moon. And I can tell by how horribly stretched these textures are. But it also has a ridge that goes all the way around the center of the moon, just like a walnut would have. After checking it out and before moving on, we stop by its moon tall to grab some science and take some cinematic shots to make it look cooler than it actually is. We then stage our rocket and come in for the third stop in the Uriam system, Holta. I really think that if you could somehow smash Minimus and the Mun together, the result would be Polta. Not very notable, but science was still collected nonetheless, and we detached one of our probes for a journey into the gas giant. As the probe came in for its imminent destruction, I noticed something. These textures look absolutely atrocious, and I was not satisfied with the first dip into the atmosphere. So I downloaded two separate mods and came back later. I'm not really sure if this is how it's supposed to look, but I mean, it's, it's better, right? To be honest, this mod hasn't been updated since 2017, so maybe there was some bug here, but regardless, we're going to take a second attempt to enter the gas giant and see if it looks any better with these extra mods. But first, we need to investigate the last moon in the Uriam system, Priax. Priax? Priax, probably Priax. There's not a lot to say about this moon either. It kind of just looks like a golf ball, but grayer and bigger. But regardless, we collect high and low science and then fly out for the main event. The Pillager Mark 7 prepares for the first ever journey inside of a gas giant. The atmosphere is much larger than Kerbin's and begins somewhere around the 350,000 kilometer mark. But it seems to be not as dense as Jules, allowing for a smooth and casual descent. At 120,000 kilometers, our probe begins spinning uncontrollably, which is obviously a great sign. At 70,000 kilometers, we briefly stopped spinning and began slipping inside of the cloud layer, which did look beautiful, but after that it was a 70,000 kilometer descent into a pitch black void with a raging storm going on all around us, until we randomly exploded. As much fun as the Pillager missions are, the Pillager Mark 8 won't reach Nidon for 32 years. So we need to start another project in the meantime while we wait for it to arrive. And there's been a subject that I have been avoiding for quite some time. The secret sauce to really pull our space program out of its infancy and into the future. We need to begin construction on a mining operation. Up until now, every single bit of fuel that our ships have used to fly around the solar system has been manufactured on Kerbin and then sent into orbit. But there is a serious problem with it. The atmosphere and gravity of Kerbin makes hauling immense amounts of fuel off the planet ridiculously inefficient. So our top scientists have designed an innovative solution to this problem. What if we take our mining and refining equipment and move it somewhere else that's relatively easy to land on and leave. Kind of like a gas station, but in space. After intense deliberation, our top engineers have come into an agreement that in order to truly advance as a species, we need to set up some of this space infrastructure. Therefore, two probes were sent out on a mission to scan the nearby moons to test if they can contain ore that we can harvest. One was sent to the Mun and the other to Minimus. But after scanning both bodies, the scientists at the VSC decided that Minmus was the better of these two options because it's relatively easy to land on and leave. After selecting a target and finding a landing spot, our engineers designed the very first mining rig for our space program. Meet the Harvester Mark I, equipped with four drills for fast excavation, four tanks to store all the ore that we mine, one Convertitron to refine all of that ore as well, a thermal control system to keep everything cool, and a large liquid fuel tank to put in all of the gas that we have refined off-world. The Harvester Mark I was launched off the pad and makes it off many moves ready to land at our selected site. We attempt a landing on the surface, and it was successful. But when I began to mine the surface, I noticed a problem. The freaking thermal panels broke off while leaving the atmosphere of Kerbin, so the Harvester Mark I can't even cool itself down. And then, it fell over. The Harvester Mark II was then swiftly designed and launched. The most notable difference being extra thermal panels and a protective aero shell to keep all the sensitive parts from exploding during ascent through the atmosphere. And we can actually begin the process of creating liquid fuel. Now that that part's done, there are two more steps to finishing the space gas station. Firstly, we need a tanker to actually get the fuel from the surface of Minimus 
and deliver it somewhere else around Kerbin. Secondly, we need a small crew to perform any needed maintenance around the outpost. The space tanker was easy enough to design, just a probe with a large amount of liquid fuel storage, as well as some space for monopropellant just in case we need to create some as well. It was designed, launched, and landed at the site without any major issues. We give the base a test by refining some fuel on the moon and transferring it to the tanker. This was all working properly, so it was time to enact the next stage. Two Kerbals were then selected. Dragonfish Kerman will be the pilot, and Tin Can Kerman, the engineer. Their ship was stocked up with food and supplies, and they were sent off to perform a mini moose landing. Everything was looking great until tragedy struck. When separating the upper stage from the descent stage, I noticed my ship was completely uncontrollable. We then realized two separate things. The engines I attached to the base were not the swivel kind, so they couldn't maneuver. Classic mistake. But also, someone, I don't know who, didn't attach any SAS module, so the base's orbit could not be altered. And worse than that, it was on a collision course straight into many more. But if you want to see what happens to Dragonfish and Tin Can Kerman, please hit that subscribe button and hit the like on the video too, because I, 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 I asked you to. Okay, bye.